I'm excited today to talk about what may be considered by some a controversial topic, but it's, it's an important topic. And look, we need to be able to talk about different things and not um, be full of fear and never say anything. I mean, if the Bible speaks on it, we should speak on it, right? And so my goal for this morning is to really work through three main topics under the heading, the Trinity, or no, God is a Trinity of Persons. Let me say that again. God is a Trinity of Persons. That's my main title, and I want to work through three main points on that. One, explain what that means, just what the words mean. Two, look at the history of this idea, and then three, do a biblical assessment, see what the Bible says. Now, when it comes to any doctrine, we should always measure it against Scripture. Would you agree? Yeah, so that's what we want to do. So it might take us a little while to get to it, but we're going to go to Mark 12 eventually. So if you want to go there now, you can be ultra prepared for when we finally get to the Bible part of this. Now, the Trinity is defined by Wayne Grudem in his uh, classic systematic theology by three statements. Now, of course, it's a much bigger idea than that, but if you, ne- if you boil it down, these are the three statements that he says encapsulates the idea. First, God is three persons. Second, each person is fully God. And third, there is one God. And the Trinity is often explained using this diagram that looks like a triangle. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but it has God in the middle. And it says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But then when it comes to the edges The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. And uh, so there's there's different ways of thinking about uh, this word person. This is our first statement that we're working with here. God is three persons. In regular everyday language, when we say person, we just mean a human being, right? We say, well, what person came over to your house or... Um, how, or we would say plural, people, right? Sometimes in technical terminology, we'll say persons, but we mean people, right? Individuals, humans. In theology, ever since the fourth century, well, maybe even later, no, no, it was in the fourth century. I, I did track this one down. Um, maybe like the 360s, 70s, 80s, somewhere in there. A new definition of the word person was invented so that it could talk about this idea of multiple persons within God. And uh, so, and I should also mention there are multiple versions of the Trinity. There's not the Trinity. There are various Trinity understandings or Trinities. And I'm just presenting and working with what's called the social Trinity. It's the idea that God is composed of three selves that are individuals or persons, and that each one of those persons is distinct from the other two. So, um, the Father has his own mind it, it, that is distinct from the Son's mind, which is, which is also distinct from the Spirit's mind. They have ind- independence of thought, and, and we can at least say will. And we know that for sure because in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Son said, not my will, but your will be done. Right. So it's clear there's a, a difference There can be a difference in wills. Uh, This happens all the time with regular people, right? I want to do something, and uh, John wants to do something else. We have a different will, and one of us has to um, compromise or or change or whatever. Uh, And so in that that example in the Garden of Gethsemane, the son uh, adopted the father's will, even though it was against what he wanted to do. All right. Now, the point... One here is that God is three persons. Point two is that each one of those persons is fully God. Um, And so I was thinking about the term fully God, and I think the best way to explain it is to look at God's essential attributes. What characteristics are required in order for you to use the G word of something or someone, right? Uh, And so these are nine that I came up with. There's, there's probably more. And, you know, if you're talking about like a Hindu God, that list is probably going to be different than this. 
this list here. I'm talking about a Christian God, something, a God who fits with what we see in Scripture. Uh, so the first one, and these are not in any particular order, is eternal. And that's the idea that if you're going to be God, you just can't have a beginning. That makes sense, right? You have to have always been there. Um, presumably, you will always be there as well. You'll be eternal in both directions. Uh, and then the second one is kind of an obscure little phrase. It's a Latin phrase. It's pronounced ase, ase. And it means uh, from himself. And the idea there is really that God is self-sufficient. There is nothing uh, beyond God that powers God, right? You know what powers us? Food, oxygen, right? We even need love and other things that are <laughs> less quantifiable in order to survive and thrive in life, right? God is ase. So if there was no universe, God would still be there. God has no source. He's, there's no battery pack powering God or, or his nuclear fusion reactor that he depends on. He's not contingent. He's not dependent. He's ase. Uh, number three, he's the greatest being. It's not like there's another one above him. And number four, he's omnipotent. We get to the omnis, right? Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Omnipotent means all-powerful. Uh, that, and and to, to be technical, I know this is a little philosophical, but the idea is a philosophical idea, the idea of the Trinity, so it's hard not to go there. But uh, omnipotent doesn't mean he can do anything. It means he can do anything that can be done, right? So he can't make a rock so big he can't move it, right? That's just a contradiction. He can't make a square circle or a married bachelor or a hot ice cube. You know, these are all just contradictory terms. So that <laughs> that's not what I mean by omnipotent. I mean, if it can be done, he can do it. Um, omniscient is all-knowing. He knows everything that can be known. Omnipresent means that he's everywhere present. He's able to be anywhere that there is, that exists. Uh, those, you, you guys do agree with these things, right? I mean, these are, these are kind of common sense. Maybe you don't have them labeled as I have them here, but you, you probably think of God in these terms. It's a pretty typical way of thinking of God. And then we have immortal here. Immortal is the idea that God cannot die, which means if you shot God with a gun, he would live. If you, if you dropped a nuclear bomb on God, God would survive, right? There, there's no way to kill God because in, the I there means not. Immortal means can die. So God not can die. He's immortal. And that's good. That's good for us, right? It makes God more dependable if he can't die. Um, and then invisible there's actually scripture that says God is invisible. It's one of his characteristics. Now, can have people seen God? Yes. But what did they see? Did they really see God in his totality, or do they see some manifestation of God? Like, for example, uh, Moses with the burning bush, right? God wasn't the fire. God manifested his presence through the fire. Or... Um, with Mount Sinai, when he came down, he torched the mountain, and there was an earthquake, and there was thunder, and it was just this awesome sight, and Moses was there, and the children of Israel, and they were like, God has come down on the mountain, right? But then later on, God says to Moses, Moses like, show me your glory. God says, well, there's a little problem with that. If you see me, if you really see me, you die. <laughs> so uh, they make an arrangement, and God kind of hides them in a cleft of a rock and passes by, and Moses pops out a little after, and just from that 40 days of glory is on his face. He has to wear a veil when he goes back to the people. Uh, just the residual effects, you know. Uh, so, I mean, God is intense, and uh, he, is, he is invisible. He can, he can manifest himself, but he is invisible, and he's untemptable. I don't, my uh, spell check failed on that one. It said it wasn't a word. But when I typed it into the Internet, it said it was okay. So I'm going to go with it. Um, I think you know what I mean by untemptable. It means you can't tempt him. James says God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone with evil. So, like, even if you said, well, God, if, if, you, um, if you give me this promotion, you know, I'll do this for you, it probably is not going to work. You know, just do what you're supposed to do and, you know, let God be God. So uh, anyhow, this is, these are what I call essential attributes. So if any person or being wants to be considered as God, that person or being would need to have these essential attributes. The essential means you have to have it. 
uh, as opposed to optional attributes would be uh, another idea. All right, so point two uh, right here, each person is fully God. Um, I, I want to use this analogy here. This is actually a, a, a real uh, set of twins, Brittany and Abby Hensel. Uh, they're about 30 now. They're two persons in one body. And they're a school teacher. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting confused with my language. They're school teachers, <laughs> but they always are in the same classroom, you know, because they share the same body. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating. There's all this stuff online about them. They, they had their own reality TV show for a minute there. And uh, they, have a, they have separate hearts and stomachs and spines and lungs and spinal cord, uh, but then pretty much everything else is shared. So like one set of small intestines, you know, for both and everything else. So, and one controls one arm and one leg, and the other controls the other arm and the other leg. I mean, it's really amazing that they were able to figure out how to drive. You know, they had to pass the driver's test twice because they're technically two persons, right? And they, uh, they get, you know, there's all kinds of legal fascinations with this. I, I'm, I'm getting distracted. But my point is, <laughs> and they seem like lovely people. I should say that too. Uh, my point is that these are two persons in one being or one body, one human being body in two persons. Um, and so that is an interesting way of thinking of God could be like three faces or three heads in one body um, or the, the, and the, this is not like a joke. This is some like very dedicated Christian artist who thought this is what uh, his God looked like um, or how he could portray it. Here's another picture, and you can see the classic Trinity triangle in this picture. And uh, I don't know if I can zoom in. I guess not. Maybe I can. Yeah. You can see it says uh, Pater on the upper left, and Phileas is, so Pater is father, Phileas is Son, and then on the bottom, Spiritus Sanctus, Holy Spirit. And then uh, in the middle, you have the word for God, is, is, not, is, not, is. So this is, this is a kind of a classic way of portraying God as having these three faces in some art. But the problem with this way of thinking about God, whether three heads or three faces, doesn't really matter. The problem with it is that this uh, statement is that each person is not part of, of God. Each person is fully God. Okay, now when I showed you those twins that were conjoined, you wouldn't be able to say that Brittany is fully that body or that, that human being. No, because she's only partially. And then her twin sister is also conjoined as partially. They're both partially that human body. So you, the faces and the heads analogy just fails. It just, it fails to represent accurately what the idea is, um, which really kind of makes it difficult to think about because that was the obvious analogy to work with. Um, and then we have the third statement. So I'm just working, this is just definitions. I'm just starting here, okay? Definitions. God is three persons. We know what that means now. It means each one has its own uh, center of consciousness, I guess. I, I, I don't, I'm struggling with words to describe it, but something like that. Each of those persons is fully God, not just part of God. And then last of all, there's only one God. Um, so God, the Trinity idea, it just is these three things all together. Now, when it comes to history, I want to move to my second point. Let's look at the history of development of the idea. I studied church history. I have my master's degree in it. I could go on for hours <laughs> on just this topic. I've got huge parts of the seven ecumenical councils memorized. We could, we could have just so much fun here. If you gave me three hours, we could order in some lunch, individually packaged, COVID style. We'll get it done. What do you say? Everyone's just like, <laughs> meet you next week, Pastor. All right, uh, so I'm not going to do that. I am going to be incredibly brief here, you know, maybe five, ten minutes. I'm not really sure. We'll see what happens. Uh, but... I want to look at stages of Trinitarian development. So the first person in history who ever used the term Trinity as a Christian is a man named Theophilus of Antioch in the year 184. 
Uh, those of you who are familiar with the timeline of Christ, about how many years after Christ is this? 150, give or take, years. So a century and a half after Christ was the first time in human history that any Christian used the T word. And what's interesting about Theophilus of Antioch is that his trinity was God, his word, and his wisdom. It wasn't the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was God, his word, and his wisdom. Uh, so it's really not anything like what I just described to you whatsoever, not even close. Uh, so that, but that's the earliest usage of the word. Then in the year 208, a Latin author by the name of Tertullian of Carthage, I believe, he wrote a book against Praxius in which he used the word Trinitas, the actual Latin word for Trinity. And he, he, he did have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as the three in his Trinity. The, by the way, Trinity just means three, right? Like unity, binity, Trinity, right? Like it's, that's all this word means. The question is, well, what do you mean by the three? Um, because, you know, I believe in, uh, you know, uh, the United States and freedom and the Constitution. You know, like, <laughs> so does that mean they're all mysteriously one essence? No, I mean, it's just three things, right? We're talking about something a little more sophisticated than that. But here's the thing about Tertullian is that he believed the Father was greater than the Son, and the Son was greater than the Holy Spirit, and he believed that the, the part of the substance, the stuff out of which God is made, the Father is made, went to make the Son. So he, he's derived from the same stuff, the matter of the Father, but a smaller portion. So this is now getting a little closer to the idea that I described, but still definitely would be considered heresy today by Trinitarians, even though Tertullian is considered by some the father of the idea. And then we had a man named Alexander of Alexandria. Uh, reminds me of uh, John Johnson, right? Alexander of Alexandria. Uh, and uh, he decided he was the bishop of the churches in Egypt, northern Egypt especially, but probably at that point all of Egypt was basically under his uh, diocese or jurisdiction. And he decided that the sun was eternal. Tertullian believed that the sun had a beginning, that there was you know, a time of creation for the sun. Alexander of Alexandria said, no, 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 no. The sun is eternal. He has always existed. And when he did that, one of his pastors in his network of churches in Egypt said, look, this is not how we grew up. This is not how I learned the faith. I can't go with you here. And that man was then not only fired from being a pastor by Alexander, but he was also kicked out of the church so that he could not attend any churches in all of Egypt. Um, and this initiated a huge controversy that culminated in the year 325 when the emperor himself got involved and held a council called the Council of Nicaea in which they decided definitively the question about how, whether or not the sun has a beginning. And they decided the sun is eternal. He does not have a beginning. We, we stamp that as our official doctrine. And secondly, that the sun and the father are of the same substance. They're not of different substance, they're similar, but the same substance. So that's really something that came in at Nicaea. But even at Nicaea, you know what we're missing? There's nothing about the Holy Spirit. In the, in the creed of Nicaea, they just said, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. That's it. It's like, come on, you guys. So we had to wait till 381 to define the Holy Spirit as being in any way on par with the Father and the Son. But even in the 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 Council of Constantinople, the first Constantinopolitan Council of 381, we still, we're still lacking so much. We don't have the word Trinity in the creed. We don't have the concept, well, we might have the concept, but it's not stated anywhere, of person like, like we have today, um, co-equal, co-eternal. None, none of that language is there in the year 381 yet. It's still in the process of development. Well, all they basically did was they took Nicaea, that creed there, and they added to it and they said, and the Holy Spirit should be worshipped. That's all they really did. They just added in that part about the Holy Spirit should be worshipped. They didn't say the Holy Spirit was God, even, 
or fully God or co-equal or any of these other terms that we get later. It's actually not until the 500s at the earliest, 6th century, that we get what's called the Athanasian Creed. And the historians are not really sure what, when this creed first got, got written. It wasn't written by Athanasius, and it's not a creed, so there you go. But uh, that's, what, that's the name that stuck, and it's called the Athanasian Creed. And really, in the 6th century, finally, we have a fully orbed doctrine of the Trinity that I just described to you. Now, for the math people in the room, let's assume it was the year 530 when this creed got developed and written down. How many years after Christ would that be? 500 years until we have a clear articulation agreed upon by the church of what we would today just call the doctrine of the Trinity. But wait, there's more. As soon as the doctrine of the Trinity started to get started and the idea of the Son being eternal and fully God and of the same substance as God came about, the second question was, well, if he's God, how is he a man? How can he be God and a man at the same time? And this is the doctrine of dual natures, which caused all kinds of other councils. So in Ephesus in 431, the question was, is Mary the bearer of God? Is she theotokos? It's the technical term for it. And they decided, yes, she is the bearer of God's nature. In 451, there was another counsel on the same thing. And the question was, is God's, does Christ's divine nature subsume his human nature? Or does he still have two natures? Correct answer, they said, was no. He still has two natures. And they developed a whole new creed. The, the Chalcedonian Creed is, is epic. You should totally read it. Um, I mean, you really want to like work out the brain muscle? Good luck. Uh, Constantinople II asked the question, are we sure about the dual natures doctrine? Did we get that right? It's a century later. It's still controversial. They said, no, we, we did get it right, and you know, these other views are wrong, and it has to be the way Chalcedon said. Then we had Constantinople III. Does Christ have one or two wills? Well, he has a divine nature. He has a human nature. It, it, does he have two wills in his own body, or does he only have one will? Correct answer, two wills. Didn't see that one coming. Uh, and then Nicaea II, this is the second council of Nicaea in 787, and this asks the question, does worshiping an icon of Christ, have you seen an icon? These are, these are icons right here, this kind of artwork. Does worshiping an icon of Christ divide the natures? Because you can only represent his humanity. You can't represent his divinity with art, right? So, and they said, no, it doesn't divide his nature. Icons are okay. And that was in 787. So what, what am I, why am I going over all this with you? I'm going over this all, all with you because I love church history. No, it's because, <laughs> because it's fascinating. No, it's because I'm just making one simple point, and that is that this idea developed over time. It was controversial for century after century after century. We don't have the last aspect of it buttoned up until the year 787 when the last council of Nicaea came together. And so it's an idea that developed over time. It took centuries to hammer out. It was not handed down by the apostles. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that it's an explanation of what the Bible says rather than something within the Bible itself. You, you understand the difference? So like resurrection of Christ, you can find a verse in there that says Christ was raised on the third day, right? You can could, you could find that in 1 Corinthians 15, like verse 3-ish, right? However, you can't find this, but... The Trinity could still be right. It's just not, you know, necessarily explained in Scripture, um, which is why we need to now look at what the Bible says, and we need to use the Bible to assess this idea. Now, I realize that um, not everyone agrees with my view on this, and I, I would say that if the, if you're in that if you're in that situation, you just hear me out. You know, you hear what I have to say, and you check it yourself against the Scripture. Because ultimately, we're all going to stand before God for what we believe and how we live. It's, it's not going to be, you know, Ruby can't stand before Christ on the day of judgment and be like, well, 
you know, Sean said. <laughs> now, having said that, I am convinced of this. It's not like a theory I'm working out in front of you. This is really something that I think happens to be true. Um, but let's look at each of the, the three statements again by, uh, this is, these are the statements from Wayne Grudem, but they're, they're widely held by a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who believe in the Trinity. All right, so the first one is God is three persons. Second, each person is fully God. Three, there is one God. All right, so let's just go through each one of the three and compare it against Scripture. Are you ready? Are you in Mark chapter 12? All right, about an hour ago, right? Uh, so let's, let's take a look at Mark chapter 12. I got to get there myself. I was doing all this talking. All right, and it says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? That's Mark 12, 28. Verse 29, Jesus answered, The most important of all is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is not a controversial verse, right? This is something you've probably read a million times, heard preached, uh, read about in books, heard in maybe some songs even, um, that uh, God is one and we are to love him with everything. Here's what's so interesting about that when it comes to this statement, God is three persons, is that in verse 29, Jesus says, the Lord is one. He doesn't say three. He says one. And then, when you look down in verse, um, then he says, the second, verse 31, is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Verse 32 is really important. Now, Jesus' conversation partner, this scribe, who we know is a Jew, he repeats back to Jesus what he just heard in his own words. And then Jesus agrees back again, right? So Jesus speaks, and then the scribe speaks, explaining how the scribe, how the scribe understands what Jesus just said. And then Jesus says, you're not, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Like, you're doing all right, buddy. You know, like, that's a compliment in the context here. So what does the scribe say in verse 32? And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one. And there's no other besides him. Now, in English, we call the word he and the word him pronouns. That's, that's just what those words are. And in English, we have singular pronouns and plural pronouns. The plural pronoun would be they and them. The singular is he and him and his. If you want to throw it in there. Uh, and so why do we have singular and plural pronouns? One designates a single person. One designates Multiple people. It could be two. It could be 2,000. doesn't matter. We still would use that. Now, if God is three persons, you need to use plural pronouns. And this scribe doesn't believe God is three persons. I think everyone would understand that because this scribe is a Jewish person. He doesn't even really believe in Jesus. He's just asking him questions. And so the scribe says, and to love him, or so the scribe says, he is one, there is no other besides him. So Jesus says, the Lord is one. The scribe says, I hear what you're saying. You're saying he is one, there's no other besides him. And then verse 33, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much better than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered like an idiot and totally missed the point, he said, Oh, thick of heart, will you ever believe that I am on the same level as the Father? No, that's not what the Scripture says. It says that when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Right? So Jesus and the scribe agree that God is one person. And the reason why I say he's one person is because they use a, a word that can only mean one person, the word he, as opposed to the word they. And then not only does he say he is one, he says he is one and there is no other besides him. This is just, this is just grammar. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't really know any other way to look at that particular statement there. And then, of course, this is not isolated. Every time... Every time people in Scripture speak to or about God, 
they use singular pronouns every time. Now, when somebody speaks to God, they typically will use the word you. Now, in English, the word you, well, at least in New York, can mean singular or plural. Well, in the South, it's different, right? In the South, you means singular, and what means plural? Y'all. Okay. Well, we're not in the South. We're not in the South, right? However, whether we're looking at the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Hebrew or the Greek, they do have two words for you. They have a singular word for you and a plural word for you. And so there's no question about it. Every time anyone speaks to God using the word you, it's the singular. Every time. Because God is a singular person, not three persons or two persons or four persons or however many persons. Furthermore, every time somebody speaks about God, like Jesus and the scribe did, they say he. They don't say she. They don't say they. They don't say it. They always say he. For example, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or his one and only son. So I, I'm having some real biblical issues with this three persons, God being three persons idea because of these singular ways of speaking about God everywhere, everywhere else. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and move on to a second point. The, remember, there are three points, which is nifty. I got to give Wayne Grudem credit for that. You know, he's describing the Trinity and he used three points to do it. You know, he, he, that was slick. Um, so the first point, once again, was God is three persons. We have some problems with that with biblical scripture. Um, the second point was each person is fully God. And I want to look at two aspects of that. One is the spirit, and then the other is Jesus, right? So I don't think anybody in the world is going to question, at least if they're a Christian, that the Father is fully God, right? I mean, that's just, there's nothing to talk about there. We all just agree on that. So the question is, is the Spirit a person who is fully God? Is Jesus a person who is fully God? And uh, so to look at this, I want to say God's Spirit is not a different person from him as your spirit is not a different person from you. Um, let's break that out a little bit. The Holy Spirit never gets a name in Scripture. Now, that might not seem like a big deal to you, but in the biblical culture, your name is everything. And if you have a significant, significant experience, your name changes, right? You see that all throughout Scripture, like Saul and Paul and a Abram and Abraham and Sarai and Sarah and so on and so forth, right? Um, the Holy Spirit never has a name. We know the name of the Father is Yahweh. The name of the Son is Jesus. Uh, what's the name of the Holy Spirit? Spirit is, is a thing. It's a, it's a, maybe you don't want to use the word thing, but spirit is a, is a word that describes a category, right? It's, it's not... It's not a name. You know why I know that? Because you have a spirit too. <laughs> and if your spirit has a name, we might have to go take you to some counseling. <laughs> Unless it's your name. <laughs> right? The spirit also never sends greetings. All throughout Paul's epistles, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why isn't the spirit saying hello? Why isn't the Spirit saying grace and peace? So it's grace and peace just from the Father, from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. It should say also, and from the Spirit. Why doesn't it say, and from the Spirit? Left out of fellowship. Uh, and I, I, I refer to 1 John 1, 3 there. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Why don't we have, why did it get left out in that verse? Intrinsic to the Father's, this is the, the key point here. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person? That's true, right? I'm looking at you right now. I don't really know what your thoughts are. Some of you might be thinking, wow, this is really boring. Others might be thinking, wow, I'm really angry at this preacher because he's disagreeing with me. me. Uh, other people might be thinking, what am I going to eat for lunch? You know, I, I can't tell by looking at you <laughs> what you're thinking. You know, those are your thoughts. You know who, know who or what, or I don't know what to call it, knows your thoughts? Your spirit. 
Your own spirit knows your thoughts. That's, that's the, the part of you that's invisible, I guess. I don't know. I'm not trying to be overly technical here. Once again, 1 Corinthians 2.11. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So the spirit is personal, but it's not a different person from God. Just like your spirit is personal, but it's not a different person from you. And if it is a different person from you, we have a word for that. It's a psychological disorder. <laughs> right? That's troubling when that happens. You ever meet somebody that talks about him or herself in the third person? I don't know if Sean really wants to talk about this next subject. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little... It's a little dist- There was a good Seinfeld episode on that back in the day. This guy just always referred to himself, and, and nobody knew, like, who's this other guy he's talking about? He was talking about himself. <laughs> Anyhow, um, what else? He's never prayed to. The Holy Spirit never receives prayers. The Father receives prayers, and uh, Jesus, uh, to a much, much less degree, but there's nothing ever mentioned as somebody praying to the Holy Spirit. Um, left out of key creedal statements. Uh, for example, 1 Corinthians 8.6. Let's go, let's go look at that one. Can you flip over there for me? 1 Corinthians 8.6. There are a bunch of different little creedal or semi-creedal statements. Creedal is like, hey, this is what we believe. That kind of a statement in Scripture. Uh, they're, they're not fancy like the later creeds, but they're significant. 1 Corinthians 8.6 says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist, and one Spirit. Why are you looking up? Your Bible doesn't say in one Spirit? No. Yeah, neither does mine. It's something. Why is it just one God and then one Lord? Why doesn't he have also one Spirit if we have all three as part of the picture from the beginning? And then... In Mark 13, 32, Jesus talks about how no one knows the day or the hour, neither the angels nor the Son, but the Father alone. Okay? Where's the Spirit there? Why isn't the Spirit... Wouldn't the Spirit know the day or the hour? I would think so. I mean, why not just... I mean, even the angels got a mention there, right? But not the Spirit. So over and over, uh, if the Spirit were a person different from the Father and the Son, we would have expected these to be in Scripture. In fact, they're not in Scripture, so that gives us good reason to suspect that that's not the best interpretation of what the Bible is saying. And then the the Spirit never is given a throne or reigns. Uh, Whereas Jesus says, if you overcome, I will have you sit in my throne as I overcame and I sat in the Father's throne in Revelation 3.21. All right, on to the next point. The next point is to look at this idea that Jesus is fully God. Well, this is not that complicated because you remember that list of essential attributes of what it means to be God? We could just measure Jesus against those, what Scripture says about Jesus, and does he line up? Does he have those essential attributes or does he not have those essential attributes? Um, Turns out Jesus is not eternal. He is begotten. And some people want to argue with that and say, well, you can be eternally begotten. Do we know what begotten means here? I mean, I I have begotten four sons. They're all in this building right now. Not all in this room, thankfully. Uh, Because the youngest one is three, and and he he would not really be tracking along right now. Um, I've begotten four sons, right? If, if, If you are the same age as a relative, the same exact age, we call you twins, right? Brother and sister, Sister and sister, brother and brother, right? We call you siblings, we call you twins. We don't call you father and son if you're the same age. It's just not the language we would use. And yet scripture always likes to call Jesus the son and call Yahweh the father. And so in Matthew 1.18 says the beginning of Jesus Christ. It actually uses the word Genesis in Matthew 1.18. Uh, not ase. Let's look at John 6.57. That's a good verse for us to... To flip over to. Remember, Ase is the idea that uh, it's, he's from himself. He, he is 
contain within himself. He doesn't depend on anyone else. In order to be God, you have to be Ase. And uh, the other term for this, if you want to look it up, if you really want to nerd out, is aseity. Just put an I-T-Y, combine it into one word, aseity. Um, but it's really from this Latin phrase. So John 6, verse 57 is, a, actually there's a bunch in John like this, but this, this is really just the clearest one. John 6, 57 says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. It's a beautiful statement, right? It's saying Jesus depends on the Father for life itself, and that if you feed on him, then you can depend on Jesus for life itself. It's a beautiful thing, but... Inadvertently, what he's also saying is that he's not Asse. He's not independent. He's not self-existent if he's depending on someone else for life. And uh, so it is also in some other scriptures where Jesus says he can do nothing on his own, repeatedly, like John 5.19, John 5.30, and other places. He's not as great as the Father. He is not the greatest. And, you know, that might sound really rude, but like Jesus said those exact words. My father is greater than I in John 14, 28. So this is not me knocking Jesus down. This is me listening to Jesus and repeating his words. <laughs> and that's different, right? Je and by the way, Jesus is awesome. He's Messiah. He's, you know, uh, virgin born, full of the spirit, did the miracles, walked on the water, died for our sins. He's coming back. You know, he's in heaven at the right hand of God, highest position in the whole universe next to the Father, right? I mean, it's not like I'm trying to bring Jesus down. I'm just trying to assess if this theory about understanding who God and Jesus and the spirit are is good or if it, or if it fails. Um, that's all I'm trying to do here. And then number four, Jesus is not omnipotent, and I say that because Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. If somebody says to you, I can do everything on my own, they're probably just full of it, right? <laughs> they're probably just, but if they weren't full of it and they really could do everything on their own, they would be omnipotent. Jesus said literally the opposite. He didn't even say I could do some things on my own. He said, I can do nothing on my own accord or on my own initiative in John 5, 19, and, and some other places too in John. There's at least four or five of them. Uh, Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. No one knows the day or the hour, not the angels, nor the Son, but the Father alone, Mark 13, 32. So then we have immortal. I'm so thankful that Jesus is not immortal. If he was immortal, he couldn't die. If he couldn't die we'd be all in our sins. We'd have no hope, right? It's so good that Jesus is mortal, or was mortal at least at the time. Um, and, you know, God can't die. Jesus died. So there's a, real, there's a real difficulty there. Now, some people will say, all right, Sean, I, I hear what you're saying, but Jesus didn't really die. Like, he just, his soul separated from his body for three days. Okay, whatever. So that's your definition of death. That's what he can't do. Immortal means you can't die. So it doesn't matter how you define the word die to be this or that or the other. That's what he can't do. Whatever it is you think dying is, is what he can't do. We know he died. That's like the cornerstone of our faith that he died for our sins. Um, on to number seven, Jesus is not invisible. You guys know, you noticed that, right? People saw him in his ministry, right? Whereas it says the, that uh, God is invisible. Uh, and number eight, Jesus was temptable in his ministry, in his life. It says in Hebrews 4.15 that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. God cannot be tempted with sin, with evil. Um, all right, and then the last statement of that definition was, there is one God. And I'm going to go ahead and agree with that one. I'm, gonna, I'm just going gonna, just gonna to give that to Wayne Grudem and be like, yeah, man, we're on the same page, right? Because it says in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, wait, it doesn't say that. It didn't say that. It says there is one God, 
and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's one God, there's one mediator between God and people, human beings, and it's Jesus Christ. And, and so Jesus is the bridge. Jesus goes between. But which side does Jesus really belong to? The man, Christ Jesus. He, it says that he is part of the human race. And then uh, another scripture on this, Jesus in John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so if I say that um, somebody is the only true you know, president of a company, there can't be somebody else that's also the president of that company. <laughs> or else you're not the only true president. Um, so I want to just conclude by saying that not only do the words Trinity, same substance, eternal generation, three persons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, fail to occur in the Bible, but Scripture, like, and I, I challenge you, go look it up. Type it into the Internet. Type it into your Bible software. Look up the word Trinity. Look up the, the phrase three persons. Look up the, 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 the words uh, one essence, one substance. Go ahead, type it in. It'll say zero results, zero results, co-eternal, zero results, consubstantial. All this terminology that is necessary to talk about the idea fails to appear in Scripture. But that's not a total defeater. The total defeater is that it lacks any explanation of the concept. The concept is missed, not just the words, but the, the ideas are missing for the Trinity. Furthermore, if the apostles taught the Trinity... Why is it missing from their recorded sermons in Acts? You know, we see what the apostles taught. We can look at the book of Acts. We can see them actually doing evangelism. They're not preaching the Trinity as part of that gospel message. If the apostle Paul taught the Trinity, why didn't any of his opponents argue against it, either during his missionary journeys or among the many issues he dealt with in his letters? I mean, between his missionary journey, journeys where he gets beaten up from town to town to town, Surely somebody would have gotten mad about the Trinity if that was part of his message that he was bringing people, and yet nobody ever mentions it? And then you look at his epistles, right? Like, especially 1 Corinthians. I mean, there's, there, everything that can go wrong did go wrong in this church, except for they just easily accepted this doctrine of the Trinity that caused, I don't know, five centuries of controversy later on. Come on. Um, it's, 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 it's too, too big of a pill to swallow. Furthermore, if Jesus was merely playing the role of a lowly human in his incarnation, why is it that after his resurrection, ascension, and exaltation, he still refers to the Father as my God? Like, I get it. If Jesus is, is playing the role of a human while he's here on earth, but if even after he's ascended, now he's in heaven and he's glorified and everything else, he's still acting like He's not God and somebody else is. And the Father never says to Jesus, my God. But Jesus says to the Father, my God, in Revelation. Actually, in Revelation 3.12, Jesus says it about four times in one verse. And he's destined to remain in subjection to God for all eternity. 1 Corinthians 15.28 says he must reign until all his enemies are under his feet. And then he will hand over the kingdom to God that God may be all in all. He himself is going to be in subjection forever. That's not equal. And that's why I think this idea is a myth. I think it's a myth because biblically it fails. So, I don't know, you have to think about it yourself and pray about it. Obviously, this is you know, a big topic. And we're going to come back to it again next week uh, when we hear a little bit more about how Jesus died for our sins and how that plays into this whole subject. So let's pray. Father, we ask that you would be with us, that you would help us to understand who you are, who your Son is, and your Holy Spirit as well. God, we don't come to you with, uh, with arrogance or pride. We come to you with humility, wanting to receive from you, from your scripture. We don't have any commitment to some tradition or some um, 
creed or statement of beliefs. Our commitment is to you above all else. So we ask that you enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we may know you and the hope of your calling and your inheritance in the saints and these other matters that are just so important for us to understand. We ask for you to bless us this day as we live for you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.